everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Just the usual reminders to silence your cell phones, refrain from flash photography, and then after the event, please plan to join us for a book signing in the lobby. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am here to introduce our guest this evening. From the walls of Fox Studios to the shores of Tripoli, to the city of Philadelphia here in the Free Library, Please join me in welcoming the best-selling author of George Washington's Secret Six and co-host of Fox and Friends, Brian Kilmeade. Please join me in welcoming. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Andy, thank you very much. Great job. It's great to be in Philadelphia. I've not been here in a while. How many people are from Philadelphia? How many people think Philadelphia is the best city to live in? How many people believe that you have the best basketball team in the NBA? <laughs> really? What, what the heck happened? When, I know, this year, is, if Dr. J gets healthy, I think they're going to be fantastic. Uh, after you stole him from the Nets, which I'm still not over, because not only did you take Dr. J, you took him off Long Island, and the team left after that. But don't feel guilty. I'm over it. Not really, but let's move on. It's great to see you. I would love to, uh, to spend more time here, like, for example, when the sun's up, to be able to walk through and see where everything started. There's not a person in this room who I believe is not very patriotic, doesn't, isn't totally enthralled with the fact that uh, democracy was born here, America was born here, and we have simply, since become the number one economic power, military power. We're the place people want to sneak into, will do anything, lie to get in, where everybody else is trying to get out. So. Sometimes we forget how great we have it, and I do thoroughly believe, and I don't have to convince this crowd, that when you're born in America, you hit lotto. I don't care if you're lower class, you're Polish, you're Italian, you're Irish, or you're lucky enough to be Italian and Irish like me. You know, hey, I got a shot here. And no matter what happens, we can complain about it, we can take action about it, but we have a shot to play the game. We have a place to protest, a place to complain, a place to get better. And the more you read about history, the more you realize uh, it was not smoother back then either. They were going at each other. They were shooting each other when they didn't agree. Just a little bit uh, about my background. I was, uh, in 1996, I started filling in at Fox. Lucky enough to get a contract in 1997. And since that time, I've been able to hold on to the job uh, into, here we are in 2015. So I had a chance to join the New York Yankees when they were known, named the New York Highlanders, if I went back then. And I knew when I walked in, even though no one else knew, if you walk into Fox, there's little articles from USA Today and Time Magazine. Uh, there's a little station that will never make it. Uh, the MSNBC launched at the same time. CNN was dominant in the market, and they were saying, CNN only gets ratings when the war's on. Why do we need two more news channels? And we certainly don't need Fox because they don't have any history of news. All true. And guess what? Roger Ailes, who got this company going, would speak to us every six weeks then every three months, then every six months to make sure everyone knew you're getting paid less, you're going to have to do with less. Our studios aren't as great. My first studio is the Sam Goodies. I mean, you could actually see where the, where the holders were that held the records on the wall, which is there's out, Sam Goodies is as outdated as records. So you saw something special happening. And then as we got closer, and then we moved over past MSNBC, and then past CNN, and then held on to that spot for 12 years, it was an, uh, a chance for me to observe how you try to stay number one. We had our 10-year anniversary. We might have plateaued a little bit, and then it was off to the races. Reconfigure, reconfigure, get hungry, stay hungry, and keep going at it. And Fox is the number one news channel, but if you think you walk into the place and anyone's complacent, you've walked into the wrong place. Everyone's happy, but they're challenged. Everyone's trying to be number one. And when the Fox Business Network joined, you have like two sections of people all trying to help each other out and all trying to, to strive uh, to be better. And the only thing I would say about Fox to add to some perspective, and I'll give you a chance to ask questions uh, a little bit, little bit later, and hopefully they'll be personal and make me blush, uh, is um, we don't take anything for granted, and I don't think we're way right. We're certainly not way left. I think we're just pro-American. I think what sticks out in retrospect, after traveling the country now on my fourth book, and having a chance to talk to people from Oklahoma to Fredericksburg, Virginia, i uh, be going to Jacksonville, going to Sea Island in a couple of days, then over to St. Louis, and also have a chance to open up the phones on my radio show, uh, which is from 9 to noon uh, daily, and hopefully you can hear us in Pennsylvania. 
is that we're pro-American. We don't get up every day and think to ourselves, what has America done wrong? Why isn't it better? We go up, grow up every day and saying, if we do not do things right, if things have not turned out, do this thing in my world, my words, hustle mistakes. Sometimes you hustle back, go back 80 yards and kick the ball in your own goal. You did it because you hustled to get back to play defense if you're playing soccer. Sometimes if you're a defensive lineman, you try to chase down a, a scat back or a wide receiver. Sometimes you might get in your own player's own way and that player gets free, but there are hustle mistakes. And as we see as Russia and France try to meddle in the Middle East, it's anything but easy. So let's talk about why we're here today and why I got so lucky to be in front of you at the Philadelphia Library. I'm like all of you. I'm patriotic. Love to find out about American history. When I have free time, if, uh, if I'm not with my family, I will be reading about history. I never thought news and history would ever meet. That's what I do for a living. That's what I do when I'm not there. I never thought they'd meet until this guy named Glenn Beck and Bill O'Reilly started doing it. Now, Glenn Beck used to open up a show at 5 p.m. where they said it was the dead zone, and he'd have black and white footage of FDR and the, and the Depression. And he'd be talking about with full screens what Lincoln did. And I'm saying, man, this guy's great, but he's crazy. People don't want to know about history. They want to know about news. And man, was I wrong, and I couldn't be happier. I love the guy, and he showed that people want a perspective on news stories. And he used to offer it and tell stories. And then Bill O'Reilly says, I'm going to do some books. And he's a great writer, and he's going to do some books about American history. I'm thinking, man, does America really need another Lincoln book? Well, the way he wrote it, absolutely. Tell an active story that gives people a perspective, not just that Lincoln was shot, that the Secretary of uh, State was shot and how it happened, how you hunted people down. People cared about Lincoln. People care about Patton. People care about Jesus. How many people like Jesus? Show of hands. All right. We're all pro-Jesus here, even if you're not. Interesting guy, at the very least. So then I said to myself, I have one story. By the way, the one thing they tell you when you make speeches, bring out your own water, because who knows, Andy might want to poison me, and he would have been successful. And you're going to have to sit here for an hour anyway, so you better hope I survive. Um, I have this one story in 1989. I'm on Long Island on this 25A. If you're familiar with it, it's a historic thoroughfare, thoroughfare, and I see this guy painting a line on the side of the road with a guide. It was a metal guide. You literally hold it like this. You pick it up and go to the next one. So I said, sir, no offense. I thought a machine did that. And he says, it does. This is going to wash away. I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, with the Long Island Historical Society, we're commemorating. It's been 200 years since George Washington came down this road to thank his spies. I go, oh, did you say spies? He goes, yeah. George Washington had spies? He goes, oh, yeah. They lived and died until 1930. It was top secret. And then little by little, this guy, Morton Pennypacker, started unfolding and putting the puzzle pieces together. When he found the last one, his spy ring was complete. Washington kept their secrets but he also kept their letters, enabled this jigsaw puzzle to get together, and these wonderful Americans, a bartender, bar owner, a longshoreman, who's also in the military, you have a farmer in Abraham Woodhull, you have a printer who's a journalist in, um, uh, in Rivington in, the, in Manhattan, Robert Townsend, owned a grocery store. Average Americans doing extraordinary things for a great cause, for the idea of a country. They lived and died, and no one patted them on the back and said, thank you. They did things that I went to the CIA, went to Langley, Virginia. They said they did things and learned things in the middle of a war that we teach our agents before they go out on a single mission. So when I got to Langley, Virginia, by the way, if you're going to go to visit the CIA, make sure Muhammad, your driver, is registered ahead of time. Because I checked, they checked, did a background check on me. They did a background check on Don Yeager and a, a, another assistant we had with us. But I forgot to bang in the uh, driver, so you end up walking that way. They had to send up a shuttle to get us because Muhammad wasn't able to get in because we could not do the background check. Not that anything wrong with Muhammad, but they got enough. But we go in, uh, room after room after room was like the opening of Get Smart. We go into the back for this historical society, but before we get to the historical center, we had to go through a gift shop. And I'm thinking to myself, who's going to get this far into the CIA and want a gift? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they got the original. So... Uh, by the way, our book is there, so they were able to sustain it and told me that this is a story worth doing, and we were able to tell it in a compelling way, and it ended up being a bestseller for 19 weeks. It was as far as number three, but this genius called Charles Krauthammer and this tall guy named Bill O'Reilly uh, beat us out. I was happy to be in that same frame. This is what I was happiest about. I was happy to expose average, so-called average everyday Americans like us who did extraordinary things, like we think we're capable of, we hope, 
for the idea of a country who recoil at getting credit like a Kardashian, but do it because they believe in it. In fact, they will go the other way if you want to pat them on the back, the more I researched. And I think it gave people a sense that America is made up of the founding fathers. They started it. But they also knew they have no country if it wasn't for the so-called everyday Americans who put the hard work in and were willing to fight, pick up guns to keep the cause alive and to fight to make our country exist. And picked up, pulled, uh, by the way, pulled off the upset of the century, uh, beating uh, the British. So I said, that's it. I'm done. I never thought it was going to be that successful. And they said, well, you got to go back and do another book. I go, I'm out of ideas. I had this one since 1989. So you got to do another book, Brian. I go, what are you interested in? And they go, well, there's this one. I like untold stories that involve major guys. And they go, well, I know you're also into the war on terror. When the, when the planes hit in 9-11, we were on the air, had a chance to go uh, over to uh, Kuwait, had a chance to uh, meet with thousands of soldiers, do countless uh, military events, uh, go to countless bases across the country, have great conversations with the generals and, and the military experts, really understood what we were up against, and the bin Laden experts as well, new four, play, four players, uh, four, four team, uh, SEAL Team Sixers before everyone knew who SEAL Team Six was. So I really got a sense of this whole story. I go, oh, that's what I really like to do, but that's been done. So I say, looked into the Barbary Wars. It's, uh, think about that. So I looked in, read a few books, and I thought they were very voluminous, very thorough, but I thought the more we looked at this, the more I thought we could tell this in a compelling way. Take the same composite with you, George Washington's Secret Six, and bring it forward. And then along the way, out comes ISIS. And then out comes Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Out comes Boko Haram. And then when you start reading what Jefferson was saying, what Adams was saying, what Washington was saying, what Benjamin Franklin was saying about Islamic extremists and how they plagued our country from day one, I go, man, I can complete that circle. And I love the other books that are out. But I felt as though I was getting lost in them. I felt as though they were written for the guy at Yale. I wouldn't get into Yale. I don't know about you. You know, the, uh, Harvard wasn't knocking on my door. But what I would love to do is to be able to expose this story of America to the masses. So they understand something that we all understand, that this is an exceptional nation, that we're not like everybody else. And it's not because we're born here and we, hope for the, and we root for the home team. It's because we get it. Everybody wants to be here. Not everybody wants to be on the New York Mets. I hope they win, but they want to be in America. And the ones that don't are the ones that are critical, and they can stay where they are. The other reason why I think the first book sold, and this book is now number two in America, is because fundamentally we're patriotic. We like to know these stories. The truck driver, the, the guy on Wall Street, the housewife, the female CEO, whatever it is, they're busy. But when you tell them about America and tell them stories, they're interested. If you tell a 16-year-old, hey, are you good in math or science? You're better at social studies than English. Well, I don't care what their answer is. How about this question? Do you like stories? What if I told you a true story? What if I told you a true story about America? The answer is, yeah, I'm pretty much interested in that, even if they are a mathematical genius or they focus on biology. And that's what's got to happen. If you like stories, if you go to the movies, you'll like this book. So what if I told you that in 1785, Thomas Jefferson had a little bit of an issue? So did the whole country, because we do not have a president we don't have a constitution, but we have our first international crisis because we had to get our economy on its feet. Because of that, we're Americans. We're going to try to outwork you, outproduce you, and we're going to get ourselves out of war debt and prove that we belong as a nation. Because guess what? The rest of the globe did not want us to be successful because we had this thing called freedom and elections. Other people had absolute monarchs, and monarchs absolutely weren't leaving. So we have to go through the Mediterranean. And on the rim of North Africa, Morocco, Tripoli, Algiers, and Tunisia. We know Tripoli today as Libya. As our ships start going by the coast, they start getting captured. The Maria, the Dolphin, the Betsy. And our guys not only get imprisoned, they not only get jailed, they get enslaved. Not only is the ship gone, the cargo's gone. We couldn't get insurance for our ships because they thought they could be captured. We couldn't get people to work on these ships because they thought they'd be gone forever and killed because these Islamic extremist pirates were taking us and using us as bait. And even though they used this Koran as their crutch, they also could be bought. In fact, one of our ambassadors was known to say, Islam is their religion, but money is their God. So you knew, even back then, these extremists aren't truly Islamic. They're Islamic extremists who use the Koran. So to figure out how to beat them, you should understand what they're reading and what they're going off of. But these guys weren't for real. 
they were abusing their own Muslim people. They made their life hellacious. I have a page in the book of all the tortures that they put their people through for doing things like looking at another woman or pretending as if they wanted to go to another state or country. So we had a crisis. What are we going to do? Two of the people we went out to negotiate died of natural causes. We have to get our economy going. So we had this guy named John Adams, and he's located in London. So John Adams knows there's an ambassador to Tripoli. So he goes, I'm going to go talk to these guys. I'm going to find out what Algiers, Tunisia, Morocco, and uh, Morocco was the first nation to recognize us. And Tripoli have, the prob uh, have a problem with us. Even though we're mostly Judeo-Christian uh, country, we're not, we don't stand for Christianity. What do they mean they stand for Islam? And if they have a problem with Britain, they don't have a problem with us. If they have a problem with Spain, it's not with us. If they have a bad history with France, don't look at us. So we thought we could rational way out of it. And they have uh, amiable conversations. We were able to find the dialogue between them because back then there was no Snapchat or Instagram. There was no uh, text messages to delete. They wrote everything down longhand. So we got it. So John Adams goes in and he says, I'm making some progress with this guy. Hey, Thomas Jefferson, let's knock this deal home. Get out of France. Come meet me over here. So he comes over there and they go meet with the ambassador to Tripoli, at which time they're horrified because they thought they had a deal. But in the end, they didn't have a deal. In the end, they had a guy that was a, a religious fanatic who thought this, and I'll read you the quote. This is from the ambassador to Tripoli. All nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners, whom it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. Christian sailors were plain and simply fair game. Uh-oh. We have no navy. We have no army. We have no president, no constitution, and we're in a lot of trouble. So they want money. We don't have it. Adams walks out of there. They're horrified, but yet they're angered. Jefferson walks out of there and goes, we've got to fight these guys. Adams says, yeah, I'd like to fight them. But did you look in their eye? If we fight them, we have to fight them forever. And John Adams says, America does not have the stomach for a long war. Man, is that still the truth? So Jefferson says, we have to fight them. What's the rest of the world going to think? Here's what he said, exactly. He writes to Nathaniel Green. My faculties are absolutely suspended between indignation and impotence at the prospect of a purchase peace. It's less expensive to fight the North Africans, though, than to placate them. But, but suddenly, Adams wins the argument with Congress. We write the checks, and we do it. And Jefferson says, if you keep writing the checks, they're gonna, the money's going to go up, and they're going to start taking our guys again. Sure enough, it happens. Washington becomes president. Our guys are still being held, sometimes for 10 years. Washington says, hey, Mr. Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, write up a report on this whole Barbary pirate thing. He writes up two of them. And both reports, they come to the conclusion without telling them what to do. Got to fight these guys. Washington, the general, says, man, we don't want to fight. We just want to work. He said, I'll do two things. I'll write the checks for now, which is 20% of our economy against Islamic extremists. But I'm also going to build a navy. And he does. Six frigates. He spends the con spreads the contracts across the 13 colonies, and they get to work. We go to school on what the British did. We go to school on how the French built them. We also knew our enemy, the Corsairs, and they had quick, fast boats. We we're going to make them quicker. We we're going to make them stronger. We we're going to make them more formidable, and we did. So we get this navy, and we're ready to go. John Adams takes over and says, "I don't think so. I got a little problem with France right now. I don't want to fight these guys. I'm going to ruin my four year my four years in office. I'm not doing it." Jefferson can't believe it. What do you mean you're not doing it? you got to fight these guys. Meanwhile, Jefferson was the guy that wouldn't get a militia together to fight in the Revolutionary War. He never lost that stigma. And Adams is somebody who says, just wants to get our economy going. So when, that, when Jefferson actually wins in a very heated battle that breaks the friendship up in 1801, he goes, I'm uh, not going to write any more checks. And I know what's going to happen. They're going to declare war. And I'm sending my frigates over any of there. And these frigates are going to guard the merchant ships, and they're going to cruise. And we're going to see what happens. See if they're going to be that tough with our Navy there. Meanwhile, he didn't know it. But Tripoli said, you're not paying us? I'm chopping down your flagpole. We're at war. And the first nation to declare war on us is Tripoli, Libya. Good thing they're not giving us any problems today. So we sent our ships over. And like every other war we're in, we got some problems. We want to just blockade because of this thing called rules of engagement. Anybody know if that's a problem today? We just want a blockade. Jefferson says, I didn't get congressional approval, and this whole country was kind of my idea. So I think that uh, go over there 
and don't shoot at them unless they shoot at you. Don't interdict their, interdict their ships unless they, uh, unless they come at you. Really? In this weather, we're going to do it? They had no way of communicating. The blockade was leaky, and the, the, the hope was they see the size of our ships, that we weren't going to quit, and they cut a deal. No deal cut. They weren't going to do it. The pirates were laughing at us. They had a few problems. Next thing you know, we got the wrong admiral there, and we got the wrong rules of engagement. Jefferson comes back, getting a lot of heat, like George Bush, like Barack Obama. What kind of war is this? But he says, all right, I need some help. I need congressional approval. He convinces him, because he's a master politician, to give him congressional approval. Game on. Then we send over Admiral Morris. Problem is, Admiral Morris brings his wife. And with a very subtle way of saying, she wasn't much of a looker. And he's not into fighting. He's going around to Gibraltar. Hey, we're a new country. Who would like to see my um, pictures of my family? I don't know what he was saying. He didn't want to fight. So guess what we did? The same thing Lincoln did. Rotated out our leaders. Got a new guy in there. And the guy that really worked is a man named Edward Preble. And like I told you about the bartender, Austin Rowe, and Abraham Woodhull, the farmer in the first one, and Caleb Brewster, the longshoreman, you're going to open this book and you're going to say, Jefferson, that's why I bought it. You're going to close it and you're going to say, Edward Preble, Stephen Decatur, James Decatur, James Cathcart, and of course, William Eaton. You're going to know more Americans. Now, if you knew them ahead of time, great. You're in the library. You're the people that would know it. I'm worried about the people outside, and hopefully it's tens of thousands going to buy the book. You're going to realize it's much more than just the founding fathers. So Edward Preble takes the fight to him. He drills his guys when they're not fighting. They have coordination, they have communication, and they're fearless. They're taking out all these ships. They're taking out these, they're stopping the pirates from boarding ships. We're blowing them away. We're, we're, playing that, we're playing their game better than them, and we're showing a stick to that the Brits didn't show, the Spanish didn't show, the French didn't show. They don't even know who we are, what we're doing, what we stand for, but they got their hands full. But we did not anticipate something we do not anticipate today that the leaders just care about themselves and don't care about their people. Even though we were bombarding the shores, destroying their walls, and boarding their ships, and killing their pirates, they didn't care because they had their power base. Like a guy named, I don't know, Saddam Hussein, like a guy who hides in a cave, like bin Laden. He doesn't care how many Al-Qaeda get killed. Saddam Hussein didn't care how many people surrendered or were slaughtered. Does Iran care? No. They're fine. So we didn't have that mentality. So then it's time to up the ante a little bit. Four years prior, Jefferson was approached by a guy named William Eaton. William Eaton's an extraordinary guy. At 15 years old, he joined the revolution. At 17, he joined it again. And then he came in, went back in as an officer after going to Dartmouth. He knew dialects. He knew languages. His guy was a leader, and he was fearless. He chained under General Mad Anthony. What a great man this guy must have been. Like He's a Hall of Famer American. So tough that the um, Secretary of State uh, Pickering said, uh, hey, William, I have a little problem with Tunisia. I think you're the right guy to go over there and try to free our guys and find out what they're all about. He picks up Arabic, notices everything about their customs, is writing back. What will it take to rouse my country? We can kick their ass. They're nothing. They're all, uh, they're all bluster. In fact, I got some great quotes from him that I jotted down for you. He gets so frustrated that we won't go ahead and take the war to him and just keep blowing him away from the sea, much like we do from the air today. If Congress doesn't consent that the government shall send a force into the Mediterranean to check the insolence of these scoundrels to render the United States respectable, I hope they will resolve at their next session to wrest the quiver and arrows from the left talon of the American eagle and substitute a fiddle and bow or a cigar in lieu. A twisted way of saying, what's going to take? Aren't you guys Americans? Fight these guys. So three years prior to when we actually get a little frustrated and there's a lot of pressure on Jefferson because he wanted to do this thing called Buy Louisiana, I needed some money. He said, uh, I got this idea. There's a deposed leader. He's sitting in Egypt. Why don't we put him in power? That crazy ass that's in Tripoli right now doesn't even belong there. They murdered his older brother. This guy's the middle brother. They took his family hostage and told him to get lost. Why don't we put him in power? Just make him sign an agreement that he'll be friendly with us. Sound like a CIA mission to you or what? So Jefferson says, you're crazy. I know you're William Eaton, and you think you can do anything. You're never going to do this. Well, after three years, he said, uh, could you send me William Eaton? So Eaton comes over, and he says, listen, we never had this conversation. Go to Gallatin, the Treasury Secretary, get your money. Get your 1000 muskets, $20,000. Go to Egypt. I never gave you these orders. He says, fine. So with a handful of Marines, 
and just a mission to go find a guy. By the way, no satellite photos, no GPS, no iPhone. So they're just making their way through Egypt. Not an easy place because the French kind of blew it up a little bit and a little angry. So we're making our way through, explaining what country we're from. We want no problem. This guy gets jailed, whatever happens. And he doesn't know if he's going to find Hamid, if he even wants his job back. But he finds him, not much of a leader, kind of hanging out with a few, uh, few of his guards. Says, you want, you, you want your country back? Goes, yeah. Why don't you come with me? Get your guys together. He goes and hires some mercenaries, some Greeks, some Italians, because they need some good cooks with great personalities. Okay, I'm a little biased. And, um, and then he gets nine Marines. They get an army together. They pick up some on the fly. And they march without maps, using the stars, 500 miles through the desert into what is now Libya. And they go outside Derna. And believe me, I'm not going to bore you with it. It's so exciting. The Marines don't trust anybody. They're sleeping on their guns. There's so many times where these guys wanted to turn around and wanted to turn on Eaton. But the leadership they showed and the, and the, the drive they displayed is something I'm in awe of. So they get outside Derna, and they realize, oops, we're outside, we're outnumbered three to one. And it's a standing army. And they know we're coming. So what do we do? Let's charge. And they do, because that's what Marines do. And you know, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, this is where the Marine hymn came from. Led by this guy named Presley O'Bannon and William Eaton, they take the city in two and a half hours. Do we live in just an average country? Are we just rooting for the home team? Or did we upset the world's superpower to get freedom? Do we stand up to do what's right? Do we take on enemies rather than pay extortion? And are we willing to do the extraordinary things because we know the mission is pure? And Eaton takes it in two and a half hours. They try to take it back each time. By the end of the time, our Marines don't have to fight anymore. These guys are fighting for themselves. They keep these horrible triple, Tripolitan army people away. The people start getting some freedom in Derna. Now, pictures in the book of Derna, and it's amazing there because they still have the place where we, we flew the first American flag. If you look outside, well, one of my stops, I believe it was in Woodlands, which is kind of Houston, Texas, he said this guy from 2004 when he was in the CIA went into Libya when we went at Gaddafi and we were making friends with him again. He said, can I go to Derna and take some pictures? And he showed me the pictures, and I tweeted him out. If you just go on uh, uh, at Kill Me, you'll see it down there. It looks the same as the sketches because they kind of were in awe of what we did. So now it's time to take Benghazi, take Tripoli, and win this thing, right? But they get so nervous in Tripoli because the, the power is actually threatened. They summon Tobias Lear, and he cuts a premature peace. Tobias Lear wanted some instant fame, and he got it. So we're going to put Hamid in power, and Eaton's going to be the hero. This is his life mission. Guess what? His knees get cut out from neath, underneath him. He finds out he's got it six hours to get in the ship or we leave him there. No longer going to support him. Now, Jefferson's not making these decisions. He actually empowers people to make these decisions. In Tobias Leary, he picked the wrong guy, a guy that's already shown he didn't have the character for Washington, even though Washington's right-hand man, and he has not shown great character with Jefferson, even though Jefferson put him in this position. So he cuts the deal. Eaton's crushed. But we wouldn't show the world that we'll take on terror, Islamic extremist terror, and we won't recoil. Now, we had to go back in 1815 and finish the job. Because James Madison, while we wanted the War of 1812 happen, they said uh, they started taking our ships and our guys again. So we went to every single place. Stephen Decatur led the army, uh, led the navy, from Algeria to Morocco to Tunisia to uh, Tripoli. Not only did we get our guys back, we released everybody else's prisoners, and we made them pay us for our inconvenience. And they stopped for 200 years, and we really didn't have much problems with them until, uh, of course, Reagan in the 1980s. And we showed them, we took a, a lesson there. We took a lesson that we fight, we stand up to terror, we will not be intimidated. So how impressive were these guys? Is Brian Kilmeade exaggerating? Does he do it in his book to tap into American patriotism? No. I'll quote Pope Pius. He says he was a pope at the time. Evidently, Pius was a very popular name because he's Pope Pius VII. To me, one pope, one Pius is enough for me. Americans, this American commander, Stephen Decatur and Edward Preble, with a small force and a short space of time, has done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom have done for ages. Am I skewing this story or am I telling this story? I'm telling this story. This is why people like it. I like to think it's because of me, because I am cute and I do have dimples. 
It's not. It's because America needs to know why we've been extraordinary through time. Yes, we make mistakes. We do this thing called owning up to them. Yes, sometimes we have a, a war plan that blows up. We adjust, hence the surge, World War II. We were caught flat-footed, and we had to reconvert all of our plants into weapons plants. But we did it, and we adjusted, and we won. That's what this story is, only in a smaller context. So I'm reading William Eaton, and I'm getting chills reading about this guy, and I'm crushed that he didn't get a chance to finish his mission, and he ends up getting 10,000 acres in Maine for his trouble. He went out and made sure everyone knew the real story. He was treated as a war hero, but ultimately he drank himself to death. Before he did, they did his biography. They go, William, you've got to do this biography. Get your letters together. Tell me the story. It was published in 1813. And I've been looking for this book. And you guys probably have it here. But I'm looking to buy the book, but I can't find it. I get reprints. All of a sudden, a week before, I look at uh, Amazon, and I find it. And they only want $110. This was written in 18 – this was printed in 1813. This is William Eaton's biography. And it's written as he spoke to his best friend, and the letters back up the story. If you think I'm exaggerating going 500 miles through the desert, exaggerating about the mutinies, exaggerating about his leadership, exaggerating about joining the revolution, you got to read it. And here's the thing. I'm not just looking to make my investment worthwhile. This should have cost me $10,000. If America knows about William Eaton, Stephen Decatur, outside military circles or, his, or amateur and professional historians or military colleges, this book is worth as much as Benjamin Franklin's book because they would tell you that they know these people had to go execute their plans and their visions, and they know that they fought with this unbelievable valor. And Jefferson did. He's, was he perfect? No. But, man, did he stand up when it counted. And other people have told me, well, you know what, Brian, why doesn't anyone know this story? I blame Jefferson. The guy had this huge resume. Declaration of Independence, kind of a big deal. Louisiana Purchase kind of work. Vice President, Governor of Virginia, President of the United States, third President of the United States, gets reelected. If you go to Monticello, you see all the inventions he made on a regular basis. This guy was so busy, he set up a mini bed in his office so he could sleep and get up and go back to work again. He was incredibly productive. So in the big picture, you thought, you know, Barbary War, we went right to the War of 1812, kind of had the Louisiana Purchase, double the size of America. It's not really that big a deal. But when you see the quotes and talk about how we tried to figure out Islamic extremism and said something like this, weakness provokes insult and injury. A condition to punish it often prevents it. I think it is in our interest to punish the first insult because insult unpunished is the parent of many others. That's why America stands up and fights. That's why when we see a wrong, we try to right it. And that's why people depend on us to do the right thing. We stood up the first time to the superpower. Then we take on the terrorists. And then we go back at the superpower, this time without the French. And we fight to a draw. And if they really got this true history of, of what the Cotton Bowlers did under Andrew Jackson, we fight to a win. Again. Shouldn't have happened. And what we've done from there is flat out extraordinary. So when the book comes out, Bill O'Reilly is on top. John Meacham did another incredible book on Bush 41. Uh, Call Rove is coming out, but this book, thanks to average everyday people like you, has surged to the point where it's number two in the New York Times list, opened up on number three. It's number one on Barnes & Noble as I walked in tonight, and the number one nonfiction coming in. And I don't say that to pat myself on the back. I say that because the American people care. And it's not just about the Fox fuel, because I haven't touched this on Fox because of, guess what? ISIS terror has overwhelmed everything. We're blowing off commercials again. We're watching with, with horror as 159 uh, Parisians are killed. We're watching again in Denmark as the whole country has gone on ice. Today, as I come here, there's breaking news at 3 o'clock in Tunisia, a country that actually profited off the Arab Spring that's featured in this book in 1785, was hit by another terrorist attack. They won after the presidential guard. It hasn't stopped. But dare I make these conclusions because I have the privilege of being a, have a great seat at 9-11. Going at it, ignoring a terrorist does nothing but heartens them. Going at them is all they understand. Showing strength and a willingness to use it is the only thing that works. Bringing them to justice is the only thing that will satisfy you. Trying to compromise will never be successful. And 
If you have a battle plan and it's not successful, keep working it and showing you're going to do whatever it takes to be successful. Hence the surge. Word went out to this Islamic extremist al-Qaeda in Iraq, we have lost. Leave. Do not come. When we said we're going to contain, we're going to analyze and get a coalition that is moderately interested in be successful, we have a situation where ISIS has flourished. The Islamic extremists that I talk about here and here are flourishing now because, sadly, we can't intellectualize a way out of this. We can't strategize this on a chalkboard or a smart board. We have to contain it and go directly at it and fight it. They have to know they will lose. Even though their goal, in case they're not successful, is to go to paradise, and it's guaranteed, not all Muslims, these Islamic extremists, the ISIS of yesterday and today, we have to show them that going to, going to paradise is not in the question, but we have to do that by killing them. And letting everybody know, if you report for duty to take us on or the Western culture on, that will be your fate. If you're going to look at the past and find out how to, follow the, to tackle this problem today, I think that's where you have to go. Unless Jefferson, of course, isn't somebody you want to look up to, or Benjamin Franklin or John Adams or George Washington are in templates in which we can build on. Because every, doll, every time I'm in a story, every third day I hear, our founding fathers would be rolling over their graves, or that's not what Jefferson intended. Well, when it comes to the war on terror, I think this is the first book that said in a compelling way, this is exactly the same war, only they had muskets, no communications, they had no Snapchat, they had no Instagram, they had to go fight without politicians meddling, and they were told, come back when you win. And that's what worked. Don't come back when you sanitize the, uh, the war zone to the point where we can interdict certain sections and factions of a would-be terror group and get together a compromise and an agreement. Those things never work. The word salads aren't infected. So that's why I'm here today, to talk a little bit about something that's all around this library, to talk about something that gave birth here, and that, of course, is the, of the birth of this country, and to expand on the book a little bit. Even though I talked a lot and got in detail, I cannot tell you how much I left out. And I almost want to fill in all the gaps, uh, but I had a chance to read this book on tape. I don't never want to do that again. It took me three days in a small room. Nobody should be alone with me that long, especially me. And that's it. A couple other things. There's two books out there just to give you my background. The games do count. It's how you play the game. I'm an athlete that wanted to be great and wasn't. And I thought that I'd waste my time. But the more successful people I talked to that didn't have that arc that made you the next Michael Jordan or, or the next Charles Barkley or the next Joe Montana, I realized you still learn a lot in sports that you could benefit from. So I interviewed 73 people on the games do count. And it's how you play the game. I even put people in history. Talked about everything from what the rock went through to get to where he is today and how sometimes success is delayed, but it doesn't have to be denied if you learn from why it's delayed. So those two books were first, took five years off in between them, came back with Washington, which is out here, and now with Thomas Jefferson, the Tripoli Pirates. So I can't thank you enough uh, for the time and for listening to me for a while, but now I got some pressure on you. I just put some time aside to get some questions. It could be about what's going on at Fox, what's going on in the world, what's going on with these books. Thought I was taller. of my background, uh, anything you want. So I want some time for that. So who's shy? Raise your hand. OK, I'll pick on you first. All right, who wants to ask a question? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir, in the middle, with the glasses and the, and the rope. Right over there. So th th there's a lot of uh, news uh, related to uh, what's going on in, let's say, Princeton and the, um, uh, the effort uh, in Princeton to um, take Woodrow Wilson um, and his intolerance and kind of you want to know what my, my feeling is? Yeah. Because they're targeting Jefferson next. And they're targeting Woodrow Wilson now. And this is what I say. Please put the, per, the perfect, there's only one perfect person that we hear of, and not many people believe it, but the people that do, and it's probably Jesus. 
And if you need to be perfect in order to be respected, if you don't understand that Thomas Jefferson is a Hall of Famer as a human being who is not perfect, join the club. I, for one, not close to perfect. I'm also not close to the achievement that he had. I don't, you know, I am not a Woodrow Wilson historian, but I understand he meant a heck of a lot to Princeton. And I think you could sit there and respect him and also point out that he had the League of Nations help us win World War I, became president in an unlikely scenario, did a good job leading Princeton, but also seemed to have real racist tendencies. And I don't know. Growing up in 1919, it seems incredible to me in 1960 there were black-only water fountains. It's intolerable. How could it be for one race to go to the back of the bus? That's unthinkable. But anyone who tolerated that in the 50s and 60s, I don't hate. I cannot put myself in that time. There were peoples of those that generation. And if you're going to gut everybody out who maybe has a statue, who did great things, but didn't have the perfect background that you believe they should have, we're going to have wreck all our statues, let's all melt them down, and let's just stand for absolutely nothing. So I'm, I'm happy that college kids understand they can change things in this world, but I'm astounded at their uh, naivete about thinking that they're going to approach all our founding fathers and say, Washington, you don't matter because you had slaves. Uh, Jefferson, the same thing because you had an affair. Um, okay, FDR, we don't respect you because you clearly had an affair. Bill Clinton, I don't know. Did Bill Clinton have an affair? I don't remember. <laughs> so how could he be the most popular current day president because you had an affair? I mean, so you're not perfect, so you can't possibly be looked up to. I think it's a real slippery slope, especially when most of us, 99.9% .9 of, uh, of people in in this country and in the world look in the mirror and aren't seeing a perfect person. That's how I feel, sir. I don't know how you feel. Uh, yes. Oh, me. I actually have two questions, but they're really short. The okay. first one is what is the comfort level of the Fox and Friends couch? Really comfy, kind of comfy. Well, being very comfortable? Yeah. I would say this is out of our, um, out of the Fox and Friends couches that we've had, and I believe it's three. Uh, number one I like about this is they don't scare you. The second one scared me. It was made out of cloth. And I'm like, guys, do you realize this used to be gold and now it's brown? Is anyone going to clean this thing up or make the change? We just shaded our lighting. Uh, so I think this is – I think it's good. I give it a seven. Okay. All right? I give it a seven, the Fox and Friends catch. The coolest thing about our set, I think, is the cameras behind it because mm -hmm. we wanted to get – I hated that we stopped with the windows. People used to be able to walk by and do things in the windows, and that used to be the supporting <laughs> cast. And they go, whoa, we got to stop that. I'm like, really? Well, you just cut off the audience. So what they did now is at least we get to see that you can figure it out if you go by. We have cameras down in the front of the building projected into our back screen. So we do have some live things, and you can see on the sides. Okay, that was one question. My second one is I, too, am a writer. Jenny Fink, you can look me up on Barnes & Noble and Amazon, <laughs> F-I-N-K. Um, but my question is, it doesn't have to be in relation to writing or anything in your career, just generally, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started? I wish I wrote and then I talked about it. So in the beginning when I first doing it, I said, this is the story of uh, such and such. And I would say about it. Then I'd go write the story and it wouldn't sound anything like my voice. I had an editor go over my stuff and say, I know your voice better than you do. And that happened a lot with George Washington. I wrote it. I read it back. I'm like, this is freaking too complicated. I'm like, can I got this? And she said to me, uh, tell me about it. So I tell her about it because I'm always talking. I get on people's nerves. And I do the radio show and the other show that I talk all the time. She goes, you just told it in a more compelling way. So we worked it out. I sat in our Fox lunchroom in 2012, and I started writing in my voice. But literally, I didn't have the transition of have my writing voice. I literally wrote it out. And that saved me so much time on this project. I spoke it. I talked about it. And the more I talked about it, the more I understood it. And then I wanted to make sure my facts were right. Then I go to historian. Then I add different things. And that's how I was able to uh, put it together. I actually think I did a better job catching my own voice. But I think a lot of experienced writers like you would say, that's really a dumb thing to say. I should have picked that up a long time ago. But I'm being way too candid. Thank you for the questions. used to do uh, stand-up comedy. Yes. What made you, you're obviously very funny, but what made you stop doing that and well, do you I still mean, do it? I was, I was pushing in all avenues. I wanted to see who was going to go. 
So my thing was, in our jobs, I was waiting for, you got to wait for the job. So you got to wait for the job. And you, I'm, a, I'm a sports guy doing the weekends on all sports radio out east. I'm doing a small uh, TV stations in Ontario, living in Malibu for $500. And I'm going, what could I do that I don't have to wait for someone to call? Well, there's always a stage. And I thought it would help me memorize things and concepts if I went up there with bullet points and told jokes in a, a successful way. Also, I went up there saying, if I failed, it's OK. I'm also on the radio and television. That's what I really want to pursue. But I also thought if I continue to push, if success leaves clues, and Letterman, like almost everybody in my generation, did everything so different, uh, I learned early, if someone's doing what you don't want to do, find out how they got there. And Letterman was a broadcaster, but a stand-up, ends up being a heck of a talk show host. So I thought it could just add to my skill set. Oh my God, did he get liberal at the end too? Yeah. Usually it's the reverse as you get older, but it was unbelievable. Uh, but you're right. Thank you for the question. I always said to myself, too, and maybe I hope this doesn't come off wrong, but I really felt like I was breaking through in stand-up when I came back to New York, and then I got this call to do the morning show, and then when to be a stand-up, sometimes you get there at 8 and you don't go up to 11.30. When you got to start, when you got to be up at 3 in the morning, you got to make a choice. And I did this thing called um, having a family, and they're like, wait a second. You're going in the city at 8, staying till 11, coming home for 90 minutes and going to work, hoping to get a con. How does that make sense? And that's when my kids were younger. They actually liked me, wanted to see me on a regular basis. They played a big role. They kind of listened to me. And that's when I said, oh, i got to stop doing that. And I didn't know, but when I signed a the contract, they said, oh, you're not allowed to do stand-up, especially on Fox. You say one thing that's different, and they say, well, how are you going to take it seriously doing the news, even if you do things – as um, you know, intellectually elevating on the stage. If you do things like, uh, even though I don't agree with him, Bill Maher, he takes politics and puts in a stand-up. They go, that could be nothing but trouble. You're not allowed to do that. But a part of me wonders if I could have done it. But they said, but most 99% of those people are doing it to get their sitcom, to get their talk show, to get or become a writer. So they're using it for something else. Yes, sir. I may have a little trouble formulating this hypothesis, but from your energy level and your intelligence and your spunk and because you come from the New York area, I have the feeling that at some point in the future, whatever happens with Donald Trump, you seem to me to have a lot of the qualities that in him are appealing. Would you Imagine, I mean, if you imagine yourself 15 years from now, <laughs> it seems to me like you're the, you got the energy, you got the stomach to run for president, and you really care about the country. Would, well, you, would you accept the job? <laughs> well, sir, you're overlooking my 10 years in jail. And, uh, and I think the American people aren't willing to put up the fact that I was in the state penitentiary for quite some time. I know that's very flattering for you to bring that up. I do think about that. I mean, I've got very good friends with Peter King. He's our congressman, and he's everywhere. He's just an everyman guy. He actually even boxes in my area. Um, I don't know why that's important. But I do, I do think about doing uh, into politics because I got a chance to know these guys. You see them in the green room. They come on all the time, and the women come on all the time. And you do th I do think about that, but to think that I could ever be president would be uh, too, too far to, to imagine. But... Um, Unlike Donald Trump, I don't have a billion dollars, so I'd actually have to raise money. So that would take up all my money, all my time. But get this, I got to, we got a chance to know Donald Trump every week for five years. Uh, he comes on, whether it's in person or on the phone. And we knew all this. I did this feature with him prior to him running for president where I do this thing called the Celebrity Stroll where I want to get a sense of their life. So I just said, let's bring two cameras, and I don't care if it's Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, Sammy Hager I did the other day or I did uh, Klitschko. I want to know what their life's like, so I want to do an interview too. So I will take it and walk down a few city blocks with them. I did it with Donald Trump. And this is what I noticed. Although he set it up, there was a ton of people when he got out of the elevator after leaving his office. He doesn't think I realized that. When we got out to the streets, you know who was yelling for him? The truck drivers, the cab drivers, uh, the guys on the street vendors. Donald Trump, what's going on? High five, how you doing? I'm like, wait a second. You, those are the guys you shouldn't be able to understand because you grew up wealthy and you're a billionaire. Those are the ones who are supposed to go, excuse me, I don't even understand you. But he was resonating with blue-collar people. 
So the hardest thing for me now is when, when he says crazy stuff like uh, uh, makes, uh, mocks Megyn Kelly, which I can never, and I told him that, and when he comes out and says thousands of people were che- tens of thousands of people were cheering when the towers went down, Muslims, that wasn't true. It makes it tough because if you kind of like the guy and then you got to sit there and say, well, that made absolutely no sense at all, um, it makes it tough. So, I mean, I know why people don't try to get close to these guys. I never thought he was going to run for president, though. But I actually, I like the guy. I get more of the sense that he would probably do a really good job as president. I actually think a lot of times he gets behind the microphone and he's like, what could I say just to go to drive everyone nuts? <laughs> There's no notes. He has no notes. He just wings it. There's not even bullet points. So he's made it very exciting. I mean, who else? 25 million people watching a debate in the summer? There's only one guy responsible for that, and it's Rand Paul. Uh, yes, sir. Right. I actually have two questions. Um, with this present Republican field, um, who do you think stands the best chance? You think tr- uh, Trump's going to prevail, or do you think uh, somebody else will come forward? And who who do you right. see possibly as a number two right. vice president? Wow. And also, my second question <laughs> You're a New Yorker, but I've been told you're an avid Eagles fan, so what's the deal with that? <laughs> Sir, you've been fed some propaganda about the Eagles fan. I have a lot of respect for the Eagles. Uh, I've watched them beat the Giants many times. I watched the game when Joe Przarczyk thought it would be a good idea to give the ball to Herman Edwards. <laughs> so I used to break out and get a virus at the same time, so a skin rash and a virus every time I saw the Eagles until Lawrence Taylor started lining up Ron Jaworski. And then I thought it was a, I actually a Giant fan, but I have tremendous respect for the Eagles. And I, um, and Mark Sanchez, I, I wish him the best. He's one of the nicest guys you're ever going to want to meet as a professional athlete. But going back to your other questions, you know what I love about this? All the experts from Ed Rollins, who I like, who's 82 years old, to Carl Rove, who was in the who was in my radio studio today, they don't know. They were wrong. They said this reminds me of, and now they can say we don't know. The summer of Trump has become the fall of Trump has become now about to be the winter of Trump. Ben Carson, who has no experience for the longest time, is second in most states. He's he's still second in the polls. Jeb Bush has got a machine that's going to be too much to for anyone to overcome. Man, he's in single digits in every state. I will just tell you what I notice. In terms of pure talent, Marco Rubio. In terms of pure belief and intellect, Ted Cruz. In terms of charisma, in terms of magnetism, for lack of a better word, Donald Trump. In terms of values and integrity, Ben Carson. True to his school, Rand Paul. They all, what I'm trying to get at is, Rick Santorum would also be a great president. George Pataki, I don't know where he's been for 12 years, but it's interesting to see a guy run for president for not, with $9. <laughs> um, I, you, we've already eliminated the governor of Texas with a heck of a resume, the governor of Louisiana, who worked for the Bush uh, White House and was a congressman. Uh, we've already, and we just eliminated the governor of Wisconsin, who stood up to uh, unions and, make, uh, and re- uh, actually required international attention. So nobody knows. That's what's cool about it. If you go outside and say, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, your, your opinion is, is worth every much, every bit as much as everybody else. What Carl Rove cautioned me of today is, at this similar time with the caucuses pushed back, Herman Cain was riding a wave of popularity last time. Man, he disappeared quick. But that was over his own, his own thing. It was, it was his own background. I don't think he necessarily did anything wrong. If they just uh, Googled him. I don't know. So... <laughs> I don't know what happened, but, and then Rick Santorum goes and wins Iowa. No one saw that coming. And Romney didn't emerge until winning New Hampshire and then had the, uh, the fight of his life in South Carolina, the Newt Gingrich ran. So think about that arc before we do anything. But I would say this, fascinating to see the Paris attacks happen and Trump go up five points. Just when you think, oh my goodness, America's going to go run and grab, some, yeah, and grab something they're familiar with, then Trump goes up again. The guy, the guy who I would keep an eye on 
is Governor Christie. He gave, okay, maybe got you guys. You guys, I'll look at you. All right, I'll, all right. See, sir, I am funny. And uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, he had this speech on addiction, which came from the heart. And I, unfortunately, not me personally, but everybody I know has had to deal with it personally. And is, if you want to destroy your life quick, have someone close to you get addicted to something and your life just collapses. To have him talk about that resonated. To have him go talk about 9-11 on a personal basis, it got him on the front page of the New York Times today, which a lot of times bad for Republicans, but very interesting. It said, Governor Christie showed that he could be president. He's had two impactful speeches, and he's beginning to pack the House in New Hampshire. All I'm going to say is, please, if he does go ahead and win, please tell everyone I'm a genius. <laughs> and he does, know what I like about him, too? If he's going to go down, he's going to go down with a fight. He has been on my radio show nine times. He comes on television. He's on special report tonight. He does the Sunday shows. We're happy to have him as producers and hosts because he answers your question. He's interesting to talk to. And he's got 6 7% in New Hampshire, and that could double. Cruz went up 12 points in Iowa in a week. Man, 12 points. He's two points from Donald Trump in Iowa, and Ben Carson's dropped 11. So just say it's tough to be the superstar and then be at the bottom and stay at the bottom. But instead of saying, I quit, he said, I'm going to work twice as hard. And he also had the stomach band surgery, so he's lost 80 pounds. He looks good. What's your view on the legalization of marijuana? I think it's a huge mistake. I just think it's a huge mistake. And I know that there's a strong argument, well, what about alcohol? I go, yeah, you're right. I think alcohol is socially acceptable. I think marijuana, I just seen personally as a gateway drug. I seen personally it robs people of their ambition. And medical marijuana, I'm all for. I don't know enough about the medicinal things, but I hear a lot of great people say it's the only thing that keeps them out of pain, whether you have um, – you know, some, some great doctors say, listen, this is all we could possibly do. Absolutely. If it helps people stay out of pain, helps them get through, uh, through post-surgery, okay. But for recreational use, I see nothing but falling downstairs. Plus, they have not worked out the edible situation. So you walk into these places, and you're measuring it out for some. And then others, you get in brownies or putting your food, and these people are ODing. You don't know the level of uh, toxicity. And the other thing I would like to bring up, too, is it has not reduced the amount of illegal marijuana that's sold in Colorado. I don't know about the other states. But know what you have, sir? I think you have a couple of things. you got this thing called the test group. Show me I'm wrong. Show me the tax revenue. Show me how Colorado's better. Show me how less people are doing this. There's less DUIs. Tell me how the drug dealers are now out of business. And then I'll say I am going to give way to facts. But right now... I would like to study Colorado, all these other states that have done it, and see what happens. I just think it's, a, it's the permissiveness of it that lets people think that it's okay, and I don't really think it is okay. My personal view, I don't speak for Fox, Fox and Friends. I don't even speak for my family, <laughs> right? Okay. Can I go two real quick? Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, and I think I speak for a lot of people in this room, we were so glad for Fox News to come on here. Thank you. After years and years and years of liberal bias in the media, <laughs> it gave us a fair, fair voice. And it, it kind of hurts when I see the left push you as extreme right. You were on Saturday Night Live, big skit Saturday. Anyway. Yes. Uh, I'm very up. glad. Thank you. Yeah, very glad to see you guys. And I'm so right. thankful. And it was a tough day on the couch because I guess Elizabeth's leaving. And that yep. was kind of emotional. But my question is, and um, I'll make it as short as I can because I can't figure it out. I'm going to speak about Hillary. So if there's Hillary fans here, I apologize. She sends an ambassador to Benghazi. Doesn't give him anything he asked for in a way of security. Ignores him. Turns around. They're attacked. He asks for more. She ignores him. 9-11, you think the anniversary, we're going to beef up our security a little bit over there. Nothing. Then the attack happens. Nothing. No response. No rescue. No anything. We lose four people. She sits there when the bodies come back, and she says, hey, we're going to get the people responsible for this, this video. video. She goes to the Benghazi hearings, 
and the left cheer like a conquering hero. It's horrible how well she did. But they proved right in the hearing that she lied. She told her family the truth. She told everybody else, including the families of those poor victims, that it was a video. How in God's name is this woman able to run for president and still being able to run for president after after those lies? Right. Uh, um, that's a good question. I, I was one of these people that watched hours of it, almost all of it. So I don't think, you know, she was composed, but her answers were insufficient. And I thought there were Democrats that could ask some real questions. I thought that they could have made it, the whole thing could have been shorter. I also think they shouldn't have interviewed until they got all the emails. They're still getting 7,000 emails like every three weeks. 7,000 emails, and some of which they're probably not happy to get out. She never answered the question of who decided what gets vetted and what doesn't. Now she says she didn't have anything to do with it. She wanted to step away. But we get into the other side of it. You know what's going to happen? I think Anonymous or one of these hackers or the Chinese are going to get in there, uh, the Edward Snowden factor, and they're going to release some emails that she did not want released. And that's what's going to happen. Because if you go by what she wants released, there's a way to rationalize out of some of it. Not really, but rationalize. But if they get in to get the real emails that were out, I think you might see that Ambassador Stevens asked her directly. It's amazing that Ben Affleck had her email, but her good friend didn't, who was in Libya. Ben Affleck pretended to be in Iran. So. And I guess, sir, you wanted the last question? Just uh, piggybacking a little bit on what he said in the beginning there, um, you know, a lot of the friends that I have, you know, the liberal friends that I have like to, you know, make fun of Fox News, you know, calling it faux news and everything else. And um, uh, working for Fox, do you have any, do you feel that you're under any pressure as far as to report the news uh, a certain way, maybe like the other networks? Zero. Zero. I, I, have, I personally have not even seen, you know, I saw Roger Ailes at an event for, uh, that he's helped the book, you know, Extreme Ownership. The book that's out is also a great book. That's the last time I saw it. Before that, it was almost like a year. We just play. We get in the game, we play. There's no talking points. I could show you my news that I do to prepare with it. We have talking points. They have no idea what we're going to say. They just give us topics. So uh, there's, there's no pressure. And I, I think that Megyn Kelly would say the same thing. I think that, um, you know, I, I think Bill O'Reilly, do you really think anyone could tell Bill O'Reilly to say anything? No one can. Believe me, nobody can. And, uh, you know, Brett Baer, his ratings are through the roof, and he's the definition of a great journalist. Greta Van Susteren, you think anyone's telling her she's been around? She's a lawyer. She's out in North Korea doing things. You think she's like, oh, i got to find out from Roger Ailes what I should say today? Are you kidding? No way. It's game on. And you, that's why. I don't know. You know, you don't know if you're going to get renewed. You don't know what's going on. You wait for your contract to come up, and you find out if you're doing a good job. And basically, this is what else the other thing that I would do, no matter what walk your life you're in, they give us the ratings every day. We keep score. We know every 15 minutes what we get. Everybody gets the ratings. So if your ratings are dipping, it's not going to be any surprise. I talk to the people at CNN. They have no idea what their ratings are. Man, how do you do that? It's like understand, like playing a game and go, uh, did anyone check the scoreboard? I forgot. Did we win? It doesn't happen. At Fox right away, they're like, you got to win every day. And that's the, only, that's the only pressure you feel. And if not, you got a few meetings, and they try to fix it. The other thing I've noticed about Fox, too, is they don't walk around going, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, and they go, this is how you get better. Unless you have a real problem, they try to keep you here. I mean, that's pretty much why I've been around since 97, not because I'm perfect, because they're willing to put me up with my imperfections, because I'm trying to get better. And I think that's why. Megyn Kelly starts as a reporter in, in D.C., is so good, she becomes this 9 o'clock stalwart that could be a syndicated superstar, uh, on, for my opinion, on the Oprah level. Worked her way up. Did they say, well, you're just a D.C. reporter? No, they saw potential. So I think this is very similar to baseball, single A, double A, triple A. You have a chance to be successful. You get noticed. You're being noticed. And there's a, it's a numbers game. So that's the only pressure, the pressure to do well. And you don't, get, you don't go, I better say something crazy to get big ratings because it's live. How, who, who knows to tune in because you could say something crazy? Unless you're Glenn Beck, who is a great guy and unbelievably supportive. Yeah. Right. But you remember, sir, it looked like Senator Ron Johnson looked bad at first for answering the question like that, and she looked strong. But the more you thought about it, that's the same thing I think might happen, too, with her hearings. But 
Uh, I know you're saying I hear the frustration, but I also know people can turn off after a while. And lastly, sir. But what about Coley Fiorina? Yeah, really strong. Let's just see see where it goes. It's not over yet. Remember, now single vote's been cast. She's not going anywhere. Uh, she reached competence and confidence. So anybody who wants to put her down, good luck. She takes on, oh, yeah, I was fired. Yeah, they threw me out. Okay, any other questions? I, I love the way she handles it. Yeah, and she's, oh, yeah, you're insulting me. You don't like the way I look. You don't like the way I handle myself. Okay. You have any other questions? I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to complain. Oh, you put me on the second stage? Okay. Oh, you put me on the first stage? Fantastic. I only got four minutes. I'm not complaining. Um, she didn't complain about the CNBC debate. So I, to me, she, she's going to walk out of this. If she doesn't get the nomination, she's going to walk out of this a superstar and maybe a running mate if she doesn't get it. So anyone who's pointing out negative things tonight, good luck trying to match that career. It's going to be very tough. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm going to uh, walk around and sign everybody's book and personalize it for you.